we have a disclosure side. I have a no conflicts of interest. I have found that I do have an interest in conflicts, which is why I'm uh, still in uniform. Uh, nothing to disclose. And uh, you know, I was reading about Dr. Heimbach and what what Heimbach, what a what an innovator and a trailblazer and somebody who really put the patient first. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nicole DeBron wrote something about him after he passed away, and you know, really said some incredible things and in how he revolutionized burn care and putting the patient first. So it's a huge honor to, to be giving this named lecture. Uh, a little bit about myself. I would have never thought that I'd still be in the US military. I joined in medical school. I went to civilian medical school and I joined essentially to, uh, to get financial support. And during my residency, I did my residency at Walter Reed Army Hospital, the old one in, in DC. And during my residency, things changed. And uh, I think everybody, well, now I don't think everybody remembers. It's been a long time, but, uh, but uh, when September 11th, 2001 happened, as a New Yorker, it was very um, obviously striking and you know very scary. But also I thought, hmm, maybe my world has changed too, being somebody in uniform. And it did, and this is a picture of uh, Operation Anaconda. And I was a third year resident on March 9th, 2002, which was Saturday. I remember it was also my 30th birthday. And Walter Reed got the first casualties uh, for, of combat casualties since the Vietnam War. And essentially since then, since that time, I've been taking care of combat casualties, whether deployed in the States and really trying to advance the mission of combat casualty care. <laughs> Throughout my deployments, I've got to go to these places where the thumbtacks are, some of them nice, many of them not so nice. Uh, I had the privilege of working at Landstuhl Hospital, which is a hospital in Germany, which is a receiving center for all of Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria patients. And then currently, like Dr. Fran mentioned, I'm the chief of the joint trauma system. So I'm filling huge shoes, standing on really the shoulders of giants who helped develop the military's trauma system, which we're going to spend some time talking about. But first, I just want to say, you know, from a burn standpoint, I really think, you know, they say space is the final frontier. But if you look really closely at the stars, uh, you'll see that actually the final frontier when it comes to resuscitation and improving care, improving surgical techniques, improving how to get patients better is with burns. You know, as much as we've learned, there's still a lot we don't know. And I think that everybody sees that with some of the differential response to burn injury that our patients have. So I was really happy to hear that Dr. Heimbach didn't really want to do burns because I didn't either. Actually, I spent my entire military career trying to avoid uh, doing burn surgery. And after I did two years of fellowship, uh, they said, hey, you're going to go do a burn fellowship. And so, you know, I, I took that, you know, seriously and I learned a ton. And, you know, I remember going to the burn ICU, looking at these really sick patients and they looked like trauma patients uh, did in early 2000s when they were getting resuscitated. And I was very impressed at the variability in resuscitation practices. Uh, you know, really, there wasn't really a, a totally, with all the different formulas, there wasn't anything that was universally adopted and accept, accepted. And the physiologic response to injury, you'd get two patients on the same night, each with a 20% burn, and one was trying to die, and one was ready to get discharged. And, you know, so, and that would happen with 60% burns. And so the, the really variable uh, physiologic response and how they respond to resuscitation Resuscitation morbidity, I learned, you know, the hard way, I think as many people do, that under resuscitation is bad, over resuscitation is worse. Uh, and that and there's so many burn patient challenges. These are all manifested and magnified really when you think of combat casualty care. So when we talk about burn care in the combat theater, you know, really trying to optimize the care of our patients and also standardize. I mean, standardizing care, if we've learned, you know, standardizing care of trauma, cardiac cancer care, you know, standardizing care is so important. It's very hard to do in an austere resource limited environment. And, you know, one of the things that we have to consider is we take care of a ton of host national patients uh, when we're deployed as well. And uh, local national patients, including children, they can't be evacuated. So managing, as, as you know, patients stay in burn centers for weeks and months. So managing the host national patients with limited resources that really in hospitals that aren't designed to do a lot of burn care. So, you know, our goal obviously anywhere is to take care of is uh, to, to optimize care. And I was very impressed on my first deployment. I had a chance to do a lot of burn surgery, especially in Afghanistan where they uh, heat their homes with open flames. So children were really the, the victim of a lot of a, uh, a lot of burn and thermal injuries and we would manage them for weeks and we'd get to know their families and we would do the best that we could not having the top two floors of all rehab and not having everything that we would have at the ISR. So deployment challenges are real when it comes to care of the burn patient. They consume enormous amount of resources. 
And you just can't replicate the modern multidisciplinary team. And the mortality among patients who can't be evacuated is higher. And in our CPGs, we address this, our clinical practice guidelines, that, you know, an 80% burn, which is, you know, absolutely a survivable injury in a young, uh, healthy U.S. service member is unlikely survivable in a place that doesn't have all the resources. And so those are real challenges. And when you think about uh, the austere environment versus what we have and what the requirements are, limited resources, limited personnel, also limited expertise. There are not that many burn surgeons in the DOD. That was actually one of the reasons I had to do a burn fellowship. <laughs> and uh, and and then and then the burn the requirements for taking care of burn to the extent of it's one of the most resource intensive um, surgical specialties. And really, the multidisciplinary approach. I think, as everybody in this room knows, the multidisciplinary approach to burn care is really something that helps our patients get better. And it really is long term care. So you know, this is what our operating room or ATLS area could look like and then deployed, you know, so if you're rounding on a patient and that's your, that's your ICU and that's your OR, very different from what we have in the States where you have your entire team and your respiratory therapist and your dietitian and rehab, you know, all on the things. So now I'm going to spend a couple minutes and talking about the military trauma system of care. I think some people in this room know it, but we do have a unique system of care and there's been a lot of reciprocity and we're going to spend a fair bit of time uh, in the next few minutes talking about the reciprocity between military and civilian trauma systems. But the military system of care is essentially in different roles of care. And as casualties move along that continuum to move from role one through role four, each level of care has higher capability in terms of specialty and higher uh, higher capacity in terms of bed space. So role one care is care um, uh, is uh, is uh, signified by tactical combat casualty care, which has really been adopted as an international standard for pre-hospital care. And this is medics. This is what medics do. And we really, really empower medics. And I'll talk about why in a couple minutes. There's no surgical capability. But when you think about the majority of life-saving interventions that have to happen on the battlefield, it has to happen with the pre-hospital provider. You know, you, you can be, if you're sitting at a role two hospital or forward surgical team, you know, they have to arrive alive in order to get their life-saving surgery. So there's been huge research investments into uh, bleeding control, hemorrhage control, and how to empower pre-hospital providers. A lot of this came from some of the work by Brian Eastridge that showed that uh, deaths that were preventable or deaths from potentially survivable injury, that the majority of those occurred from hemorrhage and they occurred in the pre-hospital space. And so tactical combat casualty care is our system of care. And it's also internationally adopted. We have a website that has all of the tactical combat casualty care guidelines, and it's been completely replicated in Ukrainian. And uh, they've been using our same guidelines uh, that for the conflict, for the war that's been happening in their country. So why has there been this huge investment? I think everybody in this room knows that death from hemorrhage occurs early. You know, life-saving interventions delivered too late are no longer life-saving interventions. So, you know, knowing that time is really one of the most important things, and this is data, uh, it's pretty early data that just shows that the majority of deaths occur from hemorrhage in the first hour after injury. So minutes truly matter. And so if you're gonna make interventions, they have to start early. And this isn't just true for uh, the military, this is also true in the civilian section. So time to death uh, from hemorrhage is, is quick. Median time to hemorrhagic death is 1.6 hours. So if you're gonna make an impact, it's gotta be early, which is why there's been so many research investments and so much uh, into everything from tourniquets to other forms of hemorrhage control, and uh, airway management and everything at the hospital environment. Like I said, it's really not just in the military. I think many people are familiar with the NASM report from 2016 that looked at preventable deaths or made estimates of preventable deaths in the United States. And in the US, in the civilian sector, it's estimated to be about 30,000 potentially, or deaths from potentially survivable injury from hemorrhage. So it makes sense that there's this huge investment into it. So one of the huge changes that started in the military well, it started a long time ago in the military and got restarted, was the idea of giving pre-hospital blood um, and giving pre-hospital transfusion. And the data from that, when you looked at that, so the green line is uh, pre-hospital transfusion, red line, no pre-hospital transfusion. There was a fourfold increase in uh, survivability if you got blood. Now, it wasn't just getting blood. It was getting blood within the first 36 minutes. We went down and did the analysis down to the minute for the first 36 minutes. So if you're going to make interventions, they have to be early. And then these, uh, this survival benefit was seen uh, at, at 30 days as well. So minutes matter and pre-hospital transfusion absolutely saves lives. And this is something that I think that 
with the pamper study, the combat study, the harmonization of those studies, there's been reciprocity in the civilian world and that's been, uh, that's been adopted. And so the fate of the wounded lies in the hands of the one who applies the first dressing. So that's our role one system. And we do a ton of training with medics. Uh, that's something that Many surgeons and senior uh, medical providers have gotten involved because if uh, if the if the medics aren't empowered to do these interventions and give blood pre-hospital and manage the casualties, then they'll never get to the role two. So the role two is your forward surgical care or forward surgical team. Each service, the Army, Navy, and Air Force have different types. They keep coming up with different names. And there's like 30 different types of forward surgical teams. It's a forward austere resuscitative team, Frenzy. You can figure out what that acronym spells. But these, uh, but these teams are anywhere from five uh, to 20 people. And it's damage control surgery to bridge the gap between wounding and definitive surgical care. And there's this balance, right? If you're too far forward, you're really just a medic. If you don't have your operating room, if you don't have a good resuscitation capability, then you're really just a medic. And then if you're not forward enough, then you're not, you're not going to be timely enough. So that's one of the things that we're always balancing is how we can improve forward surgical care. Uh, this is, these are pictures from an ATLS area on the left side. So it's what resuscitation in your OR is literally like it's right next door. I mean, there's no like time in your blood bank is, well, it's usually in the OR. So, you know, the nice thing is everything is to get all together, but it really is quite an austere and resource limited environment and forward surgical care, role two care exists because these casualties will not tolerate an hour or an hour and a half transport. They have to get to rapid surgical, surgical intervention for hemorrhage control in order to be able to survive their injuries. The next level of care on the battlefield is role three, and that's your typical combat support hospital. Dr. Mayer was saying last night that he had uh, been to the combat support hospital in, uh, in Bagram, Afghanistan. And this is the highest level of care in the combat zone. There'll be surgical specialists. They almost always have a neurosurgeon. CT scan is a must. They have specialty care. And this is where our host national patients will also convalesce if they have to stay for you know weeks and months, depending on their injuries. Uh, and then role four care, uh, is definitive care outside the combat zone. It's a permanent hospital and it has additional additional specialty care. And Landstuhl Hospital in Germany, which is really a special place. I got to spend four years there. I was there when they were part of uh, the level, uh, level one verification. We had an incredible program that was a great partnership uh, between the uh, AAST, the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and the uh, Society for Vascular Surgeons, where civilian surgeons would come and rotate. They'd hang out with us. We learned from them. They learned from us. Um, I got to operate with Dr. Trunke a couple times. You know, it was a really an incredible, uh, incredible reciprocity and knowledge sharing. And uh, I think we all got better from that type of partnership. And then there's role. So then after launch school, our casualties will uh, leave and come back to the States. And they'll go to the role for CONUS because we need an abbreviation for everything. So CONUS is continental United States. You can start saying CONUS now and uh, trick, trick your friends. And so, uh, you know, really that's where our service members get maximum return to duty. So now if you think about uh, an elevator ride here, now I know you guys get patients from Alaska. And so this is a big regional catchment area. So you have your trauma system, but, you know, from someone off the street, you know, an elevator ride or, you know, a couple elevator rides to get to that specialty level of care can sometimes be two helicopter rides and a fixed wing ride over the Atlantic Ocean. So there are definitely some challenges uh, in our, our chain of survival and recovery. And so I'm just going to talk briefly about the joint trauma system, because when we when we went uh, into Iraq and Afghanistan in the early 2000s, not only did we not go with tourniquets, but we didn't go with a trauma system. We really had no way, no integrated way to talk about patients, to know what was happening, and to really kind of improve care through the performance improvement process. So cases are still reviewed every week. Tomorrow we have our 891st consecutive weekly combat casualty care conference where we review cases that happen downrange and we talk with the pre-hospital providers and route care providers. So trauma system is all about communication and uh, integration. And so, uh, and really uh, uh, getting standards across the entire global continuum of care. So, you know, the system is so important. I think that, that, you know, we've learned that in the military and relearned that. I think that's actually one of the new innovations. When you look at what we've learned from this conflict that we truly haven't had before, you know, having an integrated comprehensive system that evaluates care uh, along the entire continuum is something that's new. The system really always goes back to the patient and it uh, starts with communication along the continuum. So now let's look at the burn continuum of care because you know our burn patients are challenging enough, but what about in the combat zone? So if, uh, if you have an injury, you have a burn injury, 
Uh, and then you have a first team that takes care of them. Now, this is very similar to anywhere else, right? I mean, you go, you go to your uh, emergency room, and then from your emergency room, you go up to your burn center, or you might have one transport in between. And that patient handoff, that yellow thing is patient handoff. But in our system, and this does not include if the patient stops at LARMC, you move through multiple different uh, multiple different and, and burn care, you know, hemorrhage care, you control the hemorrhage, you know, you control the contamination. But when you look at resuscitating a burn casualty, if you don't have an integrated system of communication, you can imagine some of the things that end up happening with burn patients, especially if you don't have a large amount of expertise in the community. So the first joint trauma system clinical practice guideline, really the birth of these clinical practice guidelines was because in 2005 in Iraq, IED blasts, and there were six civili uh, severely burned soldiers. And during the global evacuation process, so as they move with all the different handoffs and not having you know, clear documentation and not having a clear system, they got really massively over-resuscitated. They all needed decompressive laparotomies when they got back to San Antonio and they all died. And so, and then going back and uh, looking at the records. So if you look at this record, this was the documentation of what was being done. The, well, the patient with a 35% burn had 30 liters of fluid in 18 hours. So they documented it, but you know there wasn't really the the kind of the expertise to know that, you know that that's way too much fluid. Other things that were noted on the performance improvement reviews of this, the documentation was incomplete. There was tons of calculation error, errors, and I think you guys use our burn navigator. Uh, you know, so that was one of, that was the impetus. That was what started the idea is we need to give providers tools. Ironically, we don't have those downrange yet. We have them in our burn center, but there was excessive fluid administration. The, the CPG was not very clear. Uh, so, you know, we really recognized that there was a huge opportunity for improvement. Uh, and so the first joint trauma system clinical practice guideline and very, very clear guidance on how to do resuscitation. This was then uh, published and it was found to improve outcomes. I mean, certainly uh, in chart reviews and case reviews and case discussions, people weren't getting 30 liters of fluid. And, uh, and this really started us using other clinical practice guidelines and you know developing that entire uh, library of CPGs. What we have in our burn um, CPG, so the first thing is if there's a burn, we have a red phone in our burn ICU. It's like, like a red, one of those old phones that like rings, you know, <laughs> People might think it's something they should go in a museum, but uh, you know, so that if what in our, the first thing in the CPG and people print out these CPGs is call the burn center, you know, call the burn center if you get a bad burn. So you can at least start talking uh, to a burn surgeon and then we'll go through the rule of tens with the rule of tens to resuscitate. And then, you know, every hour tracking the urine. And then if there's too much, there's some safety nets within the CPG. So. Uh, burn resuscitation is something that I've found very interesting and something that I think that when you look at injury overall, there's huge opportunities for improvement in burn resuscitation. And we should all care about burn resuscitation. All you've got to do is like look and see what's going on in Israel, in Gaza, in Ukraine. You know, there's there's reasons that we all need to have a trauma mindset in a way and a readiness mindset. I mean, then and to kind of think that these things couldn't happen in the United States is um you know, it's, it's nice to believe that, but you know, the reality is things like this could happen any day. So we do care. We care from a combat standpoint, disasters, and we care for accidents. And, and as we saw with our, the combat casualties that I presented, resuscitation morbidity can be deadly. Uh, airway and pulmonary edema. I mean, you guys know this. This is just this is the same patient, you know, eight hours later after getting resuscitation. So obviously training all of our providers about getting early airways for large burns, ARDS. And now we're using a fair bit of ECMO in our burn center as well, abdominal compartment syndrome, uh, which is uh, has an incredibly high mortality. And other compartments are affected. You know, I was impressed managing a uh, polytrauma patients with burns, especially with head injuries, because, you know, their brain is swelling too, <laughs> you know, so really, so the burn affects the entire patient. And if you're not thinking about all those things, then your patient outcome is, uh, uh, is potentially at risk. So, you know, uh, I think we can learn a lot from history and we can learn a lot from our history. So this is a painting by Gauguin. It's an existential thing. It's really like, what is the meaning of life? That's what when you read about this painting, but what it's literally called is where do we come from? What are we, where are we going? And I think you can look at pretty much anything that we do in medicine or trauma to say, where do we come from? What are we now? Where are we going? 
And uh, and then we're going to just contrast this. Now, I don't know if you're allowed to contrast Gauguin with like, what was it, Professor Emmett Brown, right, from Back to the Future. And I'm probably dating myself. I, do you young guys even know what Back to the Future is? Okay, just checking. All right. So, uh, but go, you can really learn a lot by looking at the history of burn care. So where do we come from? You know, burns have, uh, you know, burns have plagued physicians and people have had burn injuries, you know, uh, forever, really. And uh, honey was used for as a topical treatment. I actually use honey on burn wounds. When I brought that to the burn center, the, the nurses really didn't like it. Now they love it. They love it. They didn't like using it at first. And they said, I didn't implement it very well. I said, just put honey on everything. <laughs> but it actually is a really, uh, it, honey is a very good treatment for uh, burn wounds. Uh, tea leaves were used and uh, tinctures of honey. And from 400 BC to World War II, they used pig fat, cold water and oil. I mean, really everything has been tried. And if you think about what would be the perfect dressing, you know, dressing that uh, it, it helps with healing, uh, decreases infection, is not painful, is easy to use. There is no really perfect dressing. There's no, and the nurses will tell you this, there's lots of different dressings. If there was one perfect one, they wouldn't keep coming up with a, a bunch of other ones. And uh, so, when, and then uh, it's going back to the history of burn care. The, prior to World War II, um, there was a huge investment, a huge investment in burn research. And most of that was funded by the Department of Defense, looking at you know, antibiotics, uh, different ways to treat burn wounds. And so um, uh, the, the DOD invested into it. And World War II is really a turning point in bur burn care. Um, like I mentioned, there was combat casualty care research and uh, it's it's funny how things happen in cycles because we were talking about the C, uh, CDR, CDMRP grants. It was almost like the same thing around the time of World War II. Um, they uh, anticip anticipated a large amount of burn casualties. Chemical debridement was what was being used uh, for some burn wounds. And the primary resuscitation fluid for burn patients around the time of World War II was plasma. It wasn't crystalloid, it was plasma. It was, uh, plasma was used for hemorrhage and plasma was used for burns. And uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, and I wish there was more written about, you know, how patients did and how they were assessed. That's another thing. And when we look at, you know, innovations is we write stuff down now and we go back and look at it. And I mean, finding things about how patients were managed and what the lessons learned were is really, really difficult. So capturing lessons learned. Uh, but uh, so World War II, uh, the, all the investments that had been done from combat casualty care research were used to take care of many casualties. And then... Uh, the military, the civilian world benefited from a lot of that research as well. Uh, this is a picture from the Coconut Grove Fire in 1942. This is a, it was a popular uh, nightclub in Boston, and this happened in November, uh, 28 November 1942. Uh, there were 492 deaths. It's still one of the largest uh, burn mass casualties in the United States. And, uh, and you know, the, it's obviously very devastating. And what's interesting, when you look, this was written down, which I love, 119 patients uh, were admitted to Mass General Hospital and all but 10 of them were resuscitated with plasma. They were resuscitated with plasma. So it's a Boston lesson learned. But now Boston hasn't learned lessons from wartime experience only once, right? Uh, during the Boston Marathon, I'm sure you know people remember this, there were people who were using improvised tourniquets. Uh, so there's a reciprocity and lesson learned, wartime lessons learned, saving civilian lives. What else? You know, so uh, when, I, when I first deployed, I didn't have a tourniquet in my pocket. Now we're required to have a tourniquet. If you can read this, it's pretty small. It says each stretcher bearer, each officer, so each person has to know how to fix a garret. That's from the American Red Cross in 1918. So, uh, you know, we continue. So I don't know if we say lessons learned or relearned or if we should just get better at uh, once we forget lessons learned, relearning them. Because I mean, it is amazing how much we know and then we forget, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there's people in this room that have forgotten more than I'll ever know. But, uh, but, you know, it is really an important thing to be able to maintain lessons learned. And then another one is obviously whole blood. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about blood and hemorrhage resuscitation. So uh, what we know, we already know this, that hemorrhage is the number one cause of death from trauma. You guys all know that, and that minutes matter. And all the data coming out from military and civilian really demonstrates the importance of time. And you know, we should think of bleeding resulting in blood failure, like an organ. We know what liver failure is. We know what renal failure is, but there's blood failure. It's really system failure when a patient has a traumatic injury, has the oxygen deficit from shock, the endotheliopathy, hemostatic, dysfunction and immune dysfunction. So then you have to say, well, okay, is there a therapy? Is there a therapy for blood failure? Does one exist? And is there one 
that is logistically feasible in a combat environment, is time tested, has been used for over a century, and when organized into pre screened donors into a walking blood bank, will actually have better outcomes than other forms of resuscitation. And that's another lesson learned from you know recent military experiences that low titer O whole blood is so much easier to use in the austere environment because it's one product as opposed to three. Uh, so this is another example of us racing back to the future because low titer or whole blood is not new to the military. And if you look at this, this says the vital role which whole blood played in the care of the wounded has been adequately dealt with elsewhere. But the essential planning that made possible the treatment of the greater portion of the wounded is a story that needs to be told. Well, I'm glad that uh, Colonel James Mason wrote that down in June of 1948. So, you know, it's interesting because when I was training, when many people were in the room training, we did not use, you know, we weren't using whole blood to resuscitate trauma patients. But back in World War I, whole blood was used. These are uh, blood collection kits. That's a picture of whole blood pre-hospital transfusion occurring during World War I. World War II, same thing. That uh, That's actually a big thing of plasma. And ETO is European Theater of Operations. That's a blood bank. And plasma was pooled then, which is one of the reasons it got a bad name because they weren't testing it for hepatitis. And you know, plasma was pooled in multiple donors. Uh, same thing in World War II. They had these large hospitals, thousand bed hospitals, and whole blood was what was being transfused. And whole blood was also transfused on the beaches of Normandy. The Korean War, if anybody's uh, uh, into history, is really interesting to read about because it really wasn't wasn't more than a you know a decade uh, after World War II ended, and every single lesson that was learned on the battlefield of World War II, from having a blood system, from rapid evacuation to bringing surgical care, it was all it was all lost. It, so when so the the first few months of the Korean War were actually an embarrassment to the military medical departments because uh, there were many uh, preventable deaths uh, because the the trauma system that had been learned and all the lessons from World War II had been forgotten. Once they figured that out, over 500,000 units of uh, whole blood were transfused in World War II. And in Vietnam, when we started in the conflict in Vietnam, whole blood was initially the resuscitation of choice. But then, you know, they started using crystalloid. And you gotta say like, why? Did they do a randomized control trial that showed that, you know, crystalloid was better? But um, started using crystalloid to resuscitate trauma patients and components, RBCs, FFP, and they really didn't have any platelets. And you, you've heard of these complications, Da Nang Lung, ARDS, multiple organ failure. So what happened in the 70s? I mean, I'm a product of the 70s, but you know, the 70s, if you think about it, crystalloid, component therapy, and you know, disco. Disco wasn't all that bad, but uh, you know. <laughs> and so uh, the, there, it wasn't just the, uh, the, the ability to fractionate blood, but it was also, there was some research coming out, and Dr. Carcio actually think, worked here for a while, uh, that was showing that uh, that burn, so this is for burn and trauma, but this is going back to burns, that a burn shock is a plasma deficit. So burn shock is a deficit of plasma, okay? And that in order to resuscitate this plasma deficit, that you use greater vo volumes of balanced salt solution. So that was kind of the thinking. So if you give a, a lot of crystalloid, you'll be able to resuscitate that. Uh, this was a study that uh, from Dr. Pruitt, and they used a ton of crystalloid and still do at the ISR, looking at crystalloid and colloid. And uh, it says that uh, uh, colloid to crystalloid resuscitation solutions may have the deterioration effect, and crystalloid solutions appear to be the preferred fluid for the treatment of acutely burned patients. And then the, the, Dr. Pruitt did so much incredible research looking at lung water. He was really a true scientist. And every study that he did continued to show that, you know, crystalloid was better. Now, it wasn't comparing it to plasma, wasn't it comparing it to something else, was comparing it to, um, uh, was com you know, just walk, huh? comparing it to colloid. So in the 70s, crystalloid was used for burns and crystalloid was used for hemorrhage. And, you know, when you look at all the things we're trying to do, right, right now the DOD is really trying to get freeze-dried plasma approved yeah. and like, you know, something that was used over and over again over the last century. And so sometimes when I'm in conversations with the people with regulatory advisors, I say, wait, do you think that the FDA would approve like normal saline right now? You know, like if you look at, it causes acidosis, you know, it causes a, a renal problem, hyperchloremia. So the the uh, resuscitation with crystalloid was not just for burns. They were also doing it for hemorrhage. So hemorrhagic shock has been described which is a physiologic replacement of interstitial fluid loss. So resuscitating 
the interstitium, which is why, which is what we did, right? Because you'd see patients and they were so swollen, there was the interstitium was, was extremely resuscitated, but I'm not so sure that was necessarily the best way to resuscitate shock. What also happened in the 70s is fractionation of oh. blood. Now, fractionation of blood is good if you're... No. Uh, it's good for infectious disease. It's good for, uh, you know, you can store it longer. It's good for certain cancer patients, but it's not necessarily good if you're bleeding whole blood to be giving component therapy. So uh, similar at the same time, when you look at the seventies, there were some changes in burn surgery. So uh, uh, Zora Genovic, Jan she was from Yugoslavia. Uh, she described early excision and grafting. We were talking about this last night. I thought that it was adopted pretty quickly. Everything I've read that you know, people recognize the importance of early excision and grafting, but apparently it wasn't. And Dr. Heimbach was really one of the people that really pushed to have early excision and grafting uh, adopted. So when you look at change and how we change and how we evolve and how we get better to take care of our patients. So early excision and grafting, uh, wasn't I, it, when you read about it, you know, I wasn't doing it. It was adopted, but you know, from what uh, Dr. Vetter was telling me last night, Dr. Heimbach had to really, really push to get that adopted and it was really one of the most critical advances in burn surgery. And then the other change was that, you know, well, figured out component therapy and this big push for crystalloid to use crystalloid to resuscitate. So it's funny because the trauma community without any randomized controlled trials said, we're going to do this. We're going to adopt uh, crystalloid and component therapy, and we're going to run to that. Now, you'd think the burn community could say, well, maybe we can use plasma again. But the burn community, they kind of were a little bit slower, a little bit slower to think about, uh, you know, adopting plasma into resuscitation strategy. So now where are we now? So the phases in burn care, you guys know this from a military standpoint, we always start with TC3. We, when we're training medics, we say, don't let burns be a distraction for the injury. There's resuscitation, definitive care, and then rehabilitation, which really, as many of us know, burn patients at last for the rest of, you know, most of the rest of their lives if they have a severe burn. And when we're doing training for our medics, we say, you know, it's really getting IV access anywhere. We used to say, don't get IV access through burn skin, but uh, that's not really the, that's not how we train anymore. You just have to get IV or IO access and so or staple in your IVs, the importance of hypothermia prevention. Uh, you know, there's still kind of when you're training pre hospital providers, everybody still wants to give antibiotics for burns and you have to keep pounding that out of people who don't take care of burns regularly that we don't give antibiotics. And we do have a burn CPG, which we're updating now. It's a little bit old. And, uh, and burn injury assessment, you guys know all this stuff. Our lung browder chart, do you guys use lung browder charts here? Yeah, so if, I, if, if, uh, if you're on a call at our burn center and you forget to fill out your lung browder chart or the resident forgets to fill out the lung browder chart, you get a call like the next day, usually in the afternoon, sometimes in the morning from the chief of the burn center, where's your lung browder? So we all have our red and blue pencils uh, to be filling out the lung browder chart. And then, you know, going to burn resuscitation. And this is one of the things that, you know, I struggled with doing burns late after doing burns after general surgery and traumas. There are so many resuscitation formula. It's kind of like pilonidal surgery. When you have like 14 operations for one, uh, for one disease, it's probably because one hasn't proven to be the best. And I think that's why people continue to evolve, you know, burn resuscitation strategies. There is an ABA consensus for the modified, uh, modified Brook formula. And that's what we use. And uh, this is, you know, for the residents, you get asked this all the time, every year on your app site, for the resuscitation formula is. And really the important thing to remember is which formula should you use? Does it matter? It probably does matter, but they're really just a starting point. And this is what we saw with our patients that was the impetus for us to do that first CPG is that if you're not monitoring them and looking at their response to resuscitation. So in order to make things easier for deployed providers, uh, Kevin Chong and Jeremy Pample and Lee Cancio um, from our burn center came up with the Institute of Surgical Research rule of tens, which is actually a really good way. You don't have to do the, you know, uh, cc's per kilogram. So the rule of tens is you estimate the TBSA, the nearest 10%, you estimate their weight. So obviously this is more in the austere environment. It's always a starting point. And then you take their burn size, their TBSA, and you multiply by 10. And that's their initial fluid resuscitation rate. And then if patients are heavier than 80 kilograms, then you add 100 cc's for every 10 kilograms. So this is where we start our burn navigator, which is an automated way to do this, uh, essentially uses this formula as well. So just an example of this, if you're at a roll two and you have a 30, 33 year old soldier injured after an MRAP uh, IED blast, he's 90 kilograms, so he's over 80 kilograms, a 50% TBSA. If he was you know, 80 kilograms, it would be 500 cc's an hour. But because he's over uh, 10 kilograms over, 
he gets a total of 600 cc's of LRNR. So that's where we start. And, you know, monitoring resuscitation, you know, uh, using urine output. But really, this is something that I think is a big gap. You know, we're, we follow lactates, we look at hemodilution, uh, we look at the urine output, which is still really the best resuscitation. We can put in echoes, but we really don't have, I think, great ways to know the endpoints of resuscitation. If the patient's doing well, it's easy, right? But if they're not doing well, it's always a head scratcher what you should be monitoring. And, and our response when they're not doing well is to give them more fluid. And I love this article because it is so true. And even though we know this academically, we're still clinically driven that fluid begets fluid. When a patient isn't doing well, they're not making urine output, they're not making, meeting their goals of resuscitation, the inclination is to always go up. I mean, at least, you know, the people that, that uh, I've worked with, and, and mine too, is you think, oh, I'm going to go up on fluids. But fluid does beget fluid, and resuscitation morbidity is real. And when I uh, started in the burn center and was watching this and escalation of fluid doses, I, this is how I would feel. I feel this on call sometimes, you know, typical bar fight. Just wanted to say, tell them to stop. It's gonna be okay, stop giving fluids, but... <laughs> But, you know, so what about plasma, right? What about using plasma for this? And uh, I know you guys are participating in propolis, but, you know, the, the question that I have when propolis was being designed is if, if, the, if crystalloid causes an endotheliopathy and you're giving plasma eight hours afterwards, are you really getting all the benefits and the anti-inflammatory effects of plasma? Um, so going back to Boston, Coconut Grove, all those patients, like I mentioned, uh, Dr. Henry Beecher, uh, resuscitated the patients with plasma. There's really not that much in the literature. I don't know if you've looked it up. There's just there's just not a ton in the literature about plasma resuscitation. This uh, is from 2015 at Ohio State. There's a res retrospective review. They use plasma. You know, it's one of the challenges with burn with burn care in general, from surgery to resuscitation, is you know there's so much heterogeneity in it that it's hard to get good outcomes data. So this was just 62 patients. It's a descriptive study. It doesn't have any uh, outcomes difference. I've had an interest in this. And, you know, uh, after Dr. Rosemary Kosmar was writing about the endotheliopathy of trauma, there's no question that there's an endotheliopathy of burns. Like, there's no question. We see it. And, you know, it, and, and I, if, you know, I think it's many people's hypothesis that crystalloid likely, you know, exacerbates that endotheliopathy of burns. You know, uh, we learn all the time that in burn patients that they have a cardiomyopathy. And, um, and I guess I would wonder, so when you guys go and go places and you're doing enteral resuscitation or doing something, is that cardiomyopathy really from burns or is that a crystalloid cardiomyopathy? You know, cause everything else swells. So why wouldn't your myocardium swell as well? And then that Im impact its, fun uh, its function. So, um, you know, enteral resuscitation I think has prospects and not just because in the military and austere environments that it could potentially be a better option, but, you know, using the gut to be able to resuscitate could definitely decrease on, on some of the edema and some of the morbidity. But people usually think about enteral resuscitation for disasters and mass cows. But when you look at, you know, and I know that cholera and burns are very different physiology, but the GI tract can absorb 20 liters a day easy, right? They can, and you just have to be sure that you have the right formula and that you're giving enough sodium and, uh, and, uh, and glucose. Sports drinks like Gatorade are super dangerous. And that's something that when we're training our pre providers, don't just give them Gatorade because without enough salt, they can get very hyponatremic. And we're doing uh, some uh, studies at our burn center using drip drop, but there's lots of different formulas out there that you can do enteral resuscitation with. There's homemade options and there's weight-based dosing. So, you know, uh, uh, I, that the ISR, one of the nice things about it is there's a lot of scientists and you know, they would come to our meetings and they heard us talk about it. So they did a perfusion study uh, looking at oral rehydration uh, solution to look at uh, kidney injury, because we know kidney injury is common in burn patients. And looking at perfusion, you know, visceral perfusion is, is preserved when you do enteral resuscitation more than it is than doing IV resuscitation. So you know, people always worry about the gut, but if you use the gut early and you don't, you know, and it's, with, it's passive, the ATP pumps that are absorbing sugar water uh, it's a passive pump. So the risk of gut ischemia is pretty low if you do it right. Now, burn surgery, as we all know in this room, burn surgery is bloody. You know, in trauma, we take patients to the OR to stop the bleeding, right? In burns, we go to the OR and we have like essentially a planned hemorrhage that day. You know that if you're doing a big excision, that burn patients will bleed. And you can estimate how much burn patients are going to bleed based on the size of the, their, based on the size of the room. So why, if we know they're bleeding whole blood, right? They're bleeding whole blood. 
why are they getting resuscitated with crystalloid in the OR? Like, why not give them what they bleed? We're uh, starting to use some whole blood in our burn OR, but I think that that's something that's ripe for, you know, investigation, you know, using whole blood and potentially just using whole blood in plasma and looking at the different ratios and how it can affect burn outcomes. So to conclude, where are we going? So I still think you know, that burns, we don't know, there's a lot we don't know. And you wonder, you know, 50 years from now when they're talking about what we've done, you know, and how we've done things, are they gonna look back and say, and then they did what? But, you know, we're very driven by, you know, everything having to come from a randomized controlled trial. But so many changes, if you look over the last hundred years and how we resuscitate patients, how we operate on patients, they were from, you know, surgeons, and physicians making good decisions and the best decisions at the best time for their patients. So really there's, you know, a, a pragmatic approach to the practice, but uh, there's definitely needs to be more investigations and more studies looking at protocols, capturing data from different burn uh, uh, centers. We didn't talk at all about skin substitutes and dressings, but as we all know, that's something that's always undergoing research. And then pain management, we're a uh, everybody's trying to, you know, do better for burn patients. We started using oral Presidex in our burn center, um, which seems to work really well. We use it in the clinic and then also registry research. And then in terms of uh, other investigations for resuscitation, I think that this is exciting, but, you know, a combination of enteral resuscitation and plasma, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity to see if you can, you know, seal that endotheliopathy and also use enteral resuscitation, avoid the edema, avoid all the complications from intubation uh, that you know, you're pretty much, it's requisite if you're doing a huge resuscitation with crystalloid. And then also FDP, the logistical advantages of using FDP in austere and resource constrained environments. Um, and then looking at inflammatory modulators, knowing that burns are uh, you know, highly inflammatory. And, uh, and then trials uh, in addition to propolis, looking at FFP to crystalloid. And then when you think of the OR, you know, certainly using whole blood and minimal crystalloid in the OR. TXA, you know, using more TXA and following the outcomes for that. I started using topical TXA, um, you know, just in the, in the spray things. It's much cheaper than, uh, than uh, reconstituted thrombin. It seems to work really well, but as soon as you put an epilap on it, it stops working well. So there's something, but, but topical TXA, you know, the joint surgeons use it, pulmonologists use it. So there's some efficacy in that, I think, but it's never been studied. And then if you're resuscitating in the OR, you know, with blood, how does it change long-term outcomes? You know, could it impact hypertrophic scarring? Could it impact, you know, nutrition? We, these are things that are really, really hard to study, but we would do our patients well if we could. And then, you know, maybe there's a ratio for OR resuscitation of big burns. You give a little more plasma than blood. You know, that's something else that hasn't been looked at. So, you know, to conclude, wartime lessons learned. Uh, are really more like war times lessons forgotten and uh, and relearned. And this is something that was written by the Association of Military Surgeons uh, well over a hundred years ago and blowing it up there says in a time of peace, and I'm not so sure we're in a time of peace, but we're certainly not actively, the US is not actively engaged in conflicts, but a time of peace prepare for war. So how do we maintain our readiness? How do we, uh, uh, and how do we continue to uh, get better? And so we know that uh, historically we've had to learn a lot of lessons from previous conflicts. And when we changed to blood, there was no, I just, you know, the red stuff changed and nobody studied it. So it's so funny when we go to the FDA or when we talk about whole blood or trying to get centers to do it, they say, well, I wanna see a trial. It's like, we didn't see a trial when you changed before, you know, and this makes sense, right? And so we know we always have to be prepared. Uh, you know, the wartime environment is one that's constantly changing. It requires agility and surgeons and surgical teams and also a wide expeditionary scope of practice. And so, you know, where do we get that? Uh, so looking at our trauma system so we can use data to understand faster, decide faster and act faster and really be evidence-based as much as possible. Our new motto at the Joint Trauma System is saving lives with data. And then preserving wartime's lesson learned. And I mentioned the NASM uh, 2016 report before, but what I didn't mention is that it really is a roadmap for like readiness and a roadmap for maintaining uh, the ability to take care of combat casualties and severely injured trauma patients. There's a huge emphasis on MILSIF partnerships. Of course, I have to call out Dr. Bulger, who I know worked for many years to get uh, you know, a MILSIF partnership here, which is extremely important. And the learning reciprocity that happens between, and you mentioned it in the introduction, between military and civilian is so, so important. During peacetime, we have to be integrated with civilian trauma care. During wartime, 
We'll continue to learn lessons. There's a national investment and a national impetus for us to get better very quickly in trauma care and then bringing those lessons back to civilian trauma systems. So that reciprocity is extremely important and MILSIV partnerships like you guys are doing here and many other places around the country are so important for that. It's true, I mean, medicine is really the only victor in war. Uh, and I think anybody that goes to war really is they're become pacifists. If not, there's something wrong with them. But, uh, but you know, we can continue to learn from, uh, from battlefield casualties and battlefield medicine, and then bring that back to military civilian partnerships and rely heavily on military civilian partnerships during peacetime. So the only mistake in life is a lesson not learned. Well, I think the main thing we know that we learn lessons, we forget them, and we have to figure out how to learn them again faster. So that concludes my talk. I really appreciate your attention uh, and thank you for this opportunity.